Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello and welcome friends, this is second lecture on democracy and today we are going to discuss some of the competing models of democracy. So in the previous class we have discussed the meanings of uh, democracy and how uh, it is very confusing and difficult to have a kind of consensus on what does it mean to be uh, a democratic country or to be a democratic person because all things that is good and virtuous is often associated with democracy. So we have uh, tried to understand um, a different conceptualization of democracy and also we have discussed direct and indirect forms of democracy and also the procedural and the substantive notion of democracy. In this class we are going to focus uh, particularly on different models of democracy where we will see how uh, democracy as an ideal, as in principles of uh, governing or a system of rule uh, is having different connotation among different thinkers even when we, uh, they all try to claim themselves as uh, democratic. So uh, to start with this, uh, Bernard Crick pointed out this uh, difficulty or essentially contested nature of uh, this term uh, democracy by pointing out that democracy is the most promiscuous of political terms. This idea is that uh, we um, uh, often invoke this term so much so that uh, to call someone undemocratic is seen as a kind of offensive or a kind of offense. So we all try to claim ourselves be democratic, but how uh, exactly we are democratic is something which can be debated and contested. So it is very uh, difficult to um, uh, define uh, in clear term, in exact term, what does it mean to be a democratic uh, society or a democratic person. So you have the competing meanings and interpretation of these terms and this is one of the most essentially contested concepts in political theory and uh, also because that uh, as we have discussed in the previous lecture that it is uh, something which has become the legitimizing idea of our time. So even those who are outright undemocratic such as military junta or dictatorship or any form of authoritarian regime yet they uh, justify their rule in the name of democracy. So this is uh, some remarkable or unique power in this idea of democracy, however it was not so historically. So even many uh, thinkers uh, who were liberal argued against the democracy which was associated with the mob rule or mobocracy or the rule by the inefficient. So the um, idea did not have same meaning or same uh, legitimizing or acceptability as it has acquired in the modern time. So uh, this remains the most promiscuous of political terms in the sense that this word means different thing to different people. So you uh, have no consensus on the meaning or the definition of the term. Different people will associate different meanings and value to this term democracy and therefore it is essentially contested concept and there is no settled model. So there is no one model of democracy. You have different competing models and some of these different models of democracy we will discuss in today's class. This um, association or this uh, confusion renders this term democracy elastic. That means you can expand it to include newer and newer dimension or newer and newer meanings and also very confusing. So all thing that is good or virtuous is now associated with democracy 
and how uh, these uh, makes uh, the meaning or the understanding of democracy a very uh, challenging task we have discussed in the previous lectures. So, today we are going to discuss some of the competing models of democracy starting with the liberal democracy, then we will do elitist model of democracy, then Marxist model of democracy, participatory democracy, developmental democracy, pluralist democracy, deliberative model of democracy and also the consociational democracy. So, in this lecture we will discuss how all these models do talk about democracy, but they emphasize or the focus is on different competing ideals of a democratic society and the state. So, uh, to start with this liberal democracy which is the widely prevalent or acceptable form of democracy is the idea of liberal democracy. Although it is not easy to have universal consensus on any particular model of uh, democracy such as liberal democracy, although it is not easy to have universal consensus on a particular model of democracy. However, a particular model of democracy which is liberal democracy has come to dominate the thinking of great many numbers of people particularly in the West so much so that many in the West treat it as the only feasible or meaningful form of democracy. So, this particular model of democracy which we call liberal democracy has dominated the minds and thinking of so many people particularly in the West that they consider or they think that only liberal democracy is the meaningful democracy and only feasible forms of democracy. And many thinkers especially when uh, the liberal democracy for a very long time was challenged by socialism or the Marxist ideals. So, after the collapse of uh, communism in Russia, uh, one US uh, uh, new right theorist Francis Fukuyama who argued about the end of history right? and by the end of history he mean there is no competing idea only one idea that triumph and that is the liberal democracy. So, he argued that the liberal democracy is the only uh, feasible uh, forms of democracy uh, for uh, the world and there is no competing model of democracy or ideas. So, uh, what is this liberal democracy? So, if a liberal state is based on the principle of limited government. So, the government in a liberal democracy do not have the absolute power, it is limited and it exists to uh, protect the individual life and uh, property. So, uh, the state in liberal perspective or government is seen as a necessary evil. So, it is seen as limiting the freedom or the uh, movement of the individual and yet such limiting or uh, curbing of individual freedom is regarded as necessary to maintain order in the society. So, the government is a necessary evil always liable to become a tyranny. So, government may acquire enormous power and may control the lives of people in a uh, authoritarian or in a kind of undemocratic manner. Now, to ensure that the government should not become tyrannical, they talk about checking the government power or putting some balance or check on the power of the government. So, this leads to the support for devices designed to constrain uh, the government such as constitution, bill of rights, independent judiciary and a network of checks and balances among the institution of the government. So, you remember uh, in the state we have talked about uh, these uh, three organs of modern state, legislature, judiciary and executive and all these three organs derive their power from the constitution and constitution set a limits to their functioning right. And these three organs exist and function also in a way to check each other. So, executive should not expand or use its power undemocratically or unconstitutionally. So, there is a parliament to check that um, or judiciary to ensure that the parliament or executive should not uh, function besides the limits set by the uh, constitution or beyond the limits set by the constitution. So, the liberal democracy talks about to ensure 
how a government and a state should not become tyrannical and they do so by having these mechanisms like constitution, bill of rights, independent judiciary and the network of check and balances among the organs and the institutions of a state. So, liberal democracy moreover besides these constitution, judiciary, bill of rights and checks and balances among the institution also respect the existence and also promotes a vigorous healthy civil society based upon the respect for civil liberties and property rights. So, liberal democracy promotes a vibrant or healthy civil society where freedom of speech and expression is guaranteed, uh, the uh, right to criticize the government is uh, protected, civil liberties and the uh, property rights are also protected for the individual. So, these are the broader understanding of a functioning liberal democracy. So, liberal democratic uh, rule therefore, typically coexists with a capitalist economic order and this is the uh, challenging part of a liberal democracy where you see all liberal democratic state also promotes the capitalist economic order or uh, free market economy. So, the democratic element a liberal democracy is the idea of popular consent expressed in practice through the act of voting. So, the uh, how this popular consent is exercised in a liberal democracy. It is not done on day to day basis as in direct participative model of democracy which we will discuss later, but it is done through periodic election in free and fair manner. So, the voting and right to voting ensures the political equality of every member of that society they come together and participate in the voting and then give consent to a political party to form the government. So, this popular consent in a liberal democracy is ensured through the act of voting. So, liberal democracy is thus a form of electoral democracy in which popular election is seen the only legitimate source of political authority. So, in a liberal democracy the idea of election and having the election periodically in a free and fair manner is therefore, very necessary for the legitimacy of the government. Nevertheless, the liberal democracy does not command universal approval or respect. Its principal critiques have been two models that we will discuss today, particularly elitists and the Marxists. So, it argues that it provides uh, protection to every individual, but elitist will argue that no, it is only the few who is uh, no matter what the forms of government enjoy or exercise power in the society or the Marxist which believes that liberal democracy is actually the bourgeois democracy which protects the interest of capitalist and work to enhance or protect the interest of the capitalist against the majority working class in the society. So, you uh, see a kind of uh, uh, thinking or a kind of assumption that the liberal democracy is the only feasible modes of democracy particularly in the West. However, it is not universally accepted as we have seen by the elitist and Marxist who criticize this liberal uh, democracy and also because uh, that simultaneous existence of liberal democracy with free market economy which many people argue works for private profit or uh, works in the interest of those who already have the property. So, uh, that makes the liberal democracy somewhat problematic for uh, many uh, thinkers and uh, scholars particularly those who argued about elitist and the Marxist model of democracy. So, we must remember that the mere structure of a liberal democracy is no guarantee of achieving the objective of democracy. So, this we have discussed in the procedural or the substantive notion of democracy as well. So, uh, it is possible that a country may claim itself to be a democracy or a liberal democracy in terms of procedure. So, there will be a free election and so on, uh, periodic election, but that procedural nature of its rule does not necessarily makes it a democracy because democracy is something which is more than the procedure. It is about creating a system where people will is reflected in every decision that state or system of rule makes. 
So, uh, liberal democracy also has this uh, uh, challenge of ensuring that democracy is maintained not just in procedure, but also in substance. Now, moving on to the next model of democracy, which is elitist democracy. And this uh, model of democracy talks about how in a society, it is not the majority who rules or command or exercise power, but it is always a few selected minority which have the capacity or expertise to command, rule and govern. So, the elitist theory holds that every society consists of two categories of men, the elite or the minority within a social collectivity, it may be a society, a state, religious institution, political parties and so on. So, in any collectivity, you will find two categories of men, one is the elite. So, this elite or the minority exercise preponderant influence within that collectivity. So, within that collectivity, be it state, society, religious institution or the party, this is a small group of people who are in the minority exercise enormous power and the masses or the majority which is governed by the elite. So, they remain the subject of the power of the elite. So, Wilfredo Pareto, the mind and the society was the first to use the term elite and masses to indicate superior and the inferior groups in society. Although the idea of such division of society was given earlier by Gietno Mosca and Robert Michel. So, Gaetano uh, Mosca in the ruling class 1896 and Robert Michel's political parties, a sociological study of oligarchical tendency of modern uh, democracy in 1991, also talks about this division of society into inferior or the superior class. So, Mosca postulated that the people are necessarily divided into two groups, the rulers and the ruled. The ruling class control most of the wealth power and prestige in society and exercise all power and the ruled are not competent to replace it. So, Michels propounded his famous iron law of oligarchy which implied that every organization whatever is its original aim is eventually reduced to an oligarchy that is small group of people or minority which controls and exercise all the power, all the institution and the apparatus of the state. So, this iron law of oligarchy is the rule of the chosen few based on their manipulative skills. So, majority of human beings are apathetic, indolent or slavish and they are permanently incapable of self-government. So, in contrast to this liberal idea that democracy is about self-rule or the self-government, it is also there in Mahatma uh, Gandhi. The elitist theories of democracy argue that it is always the chosen few who manipulate, who actually exercise power and authority in a society and not uh, the majority of the people who are always uh, dependent on the elite. Similarly, in the power elite, this is a text written by C. Wright Mills, a sociologist uh, from US argues about the interwoven interest of the military, corporate and the political leaders in the society and how this interwoven interest among these group of leaders, military, corporate and political leaders actually command or uh, rule the ordinary uh, citizens which remain powerless and dependent to their rule. So, it is the uh, power elite who actually exercise power. So, in this theory what we uh, gather is that society which is divided into two groups is always ruled no matter what is the form of government or the system of rule by the small minority who has the capacity, vision or uh, expertise to rule or to exercise uh, power in the society. So, the champions of democracy found it difficult to repudiate this argument advanced by the elitist theory they therefore sought to accommodate the elite theory in the framework of democratic theory, so which is quite contradictory uh, to each other and yet many theorists considering this functioning of say iron uh, law of oligarchy where the small men will uh, be actually controlling and governing or taking decisions on behalf of everyone. So, by not repudiating this argument which is advanced by the elitist theory, 
many democratic theorists tried to accommodate this elitist uh, theory of democracy within their democratic theorization. So, the elitist democratic theory or democratic elitism was developed by several writers such as Karl Menheim, Joseph A. Schumpeter, Raymond Aron or G. Sartorari. So, the attraction of liberal democracy is its capacity to blend. So, they argue that in democracy it is possible to blend the elite rule with a significant measure of popular participation. So, the popular participation is in this theory is to legitimize the rule of elite. So, it blends the in elite rule with a significant measure of uh, say political participation. So, for example, uh, a country may be governed by the small elite, but during the time of election every single individual of that country will uh, participate in voting and thereby ensuring which elite gets to uh, vote. So, it blends the elite rule with a significant measure of popular participation and government is interested to professional politicians, but these politicians are forced to respond to the popular pressure. So, the election therefore, functions as a kind of control or a check on the power of these elites and they must respond to the popular pressure. So, uh, uh, this is done by the simple fact that the public put them there. So, they are elected by the public and they can also be removed by the people from the office they hold. So, Joseph Sumpeter summed this up in capitalism, socialism and democracy by describing the democratic method as that institutional arrangement for arriving at political decisions in which individual acquire the power to decide by means of a competitive struggle for the people's vote. So, this uh, securing the majority or to get the mandate of the people leads a kind of competitiveness among the elites and democratic methods then provides that institutional arrangement where the political decision in which individual acquire the power to decide is uh, done by uh, the competitive struggle to secure the majority or most of the votes of the people. Thus, the virtue of elite rule that is government by experts educated or well informed are balanced against the need for public accountability. So, Schumpeter advanced a form of democratic elitism in suggesting that though power is always exercised by an elite, competition among a number of elites ensure that the popular voice is heard. So, within a democratic uh, elitism, which is supposed to be a government by the expert, educated and well informed, there is a kind of balance between the elite and their ability to exercise the power and the popular will because the elite will compete among themselves. So, there is no one uh, fixed elite which will run uh, the uh, uh, government again and again. So, to run the government there is also the competition among the elites and that competition is to secure the maximum vote from the electorate and thereby it ensures that all the elites must also hear the voice of the people and that arrangement ensure that the popular voice is heard in the functioning of democracy. So, the elite theorists argue that democracy can be realized in a liberal society if two conditions are fulfilled. These conditions are there is an open elite system. So, the elite is not a closed uh, group, it is an open that is recruitment of elites is relatively open so that the especially talented and enterprising person find adequate opportunity to join the cadre of elites and the new elites is permitted to replace the dominant elites which might have lost its credibility. So, there is a kind of continuous movement or inclusiveness of this small minority uh, or a small section in the society which we call elites where new enterprising or uh, competent persons are allowed to join this uh, small group of minorities in terms of elites and those elites which are no longer uh, creditable or no longer relevant also move out of from that small uh, section in the society. So, these are kind of 
continuous flow in the making of elite in a particular society so if that so that is the one condition that the elite is something which is not closed group or not a rigid uh, group of people but there is constant inclusion of new people with competence and expertise so that's one and the second ordinary people are given an opportunity to choose the ruling elite so this ensures democracy where the elites and uh, joining that small groups of elites require competence and expertise which is open and new people can join that group of elites and also it ensure that the ordinary people are given an opportunity to choose the ruling elites at regular intervals so therefore the election right in the free and fair manner that is there is a provision for periodic election based on the universal and this right to vote is not limited to only male or white male or educated or property male and so on so there is a kind of universal suffrage so if these two conditions are met then it will be a functioning democratic society where the elites and its constitution are not closed and rigid but open and inclusive to new person with expertise and competencies and second the ordinary people have the right to choose the elites through uh, voting which is done periodically in a free and fair manner now coming to the next model of democracy that is marxist model of democracy marxist criticizes the prevalent liberal democracy because it harbors the capitalist system in which the majority of people comprising workers is deprived of power so liberal democracy by fostering the capitalist economic system exclusively serves the interest of the bourgeoisie bourgeoisie is the capitalist class in a capitalist uh, society so marxist therefore dubbed liberal democracy as bourgeois democracy so the marxist critique of liberal democracy has focused upon the inherent tension between democracy and capitalism and liberal democracy are according to marxist capitalist or bourgeois democracy where the uh, purpose or the very objective of a liberal democracy is to protect and enhance the interest of the bourgeoisie against the majoritarian working class so uh, liberal democracies are according to marxist capitalist or bourgeois democracy manipulated and controlled by one class so they argue that since the capitalist system of production serves the economic interest of the bourgeoisie its political superstructure which they call liberal democracy is the political superstructure of a class which actually dominates the economic sphere so in the economic sphere society is divided into haves and have nots which we can also call bourgeoisie or the proletariat their interests are diametrically opposite to each other so how a liberal democracy can satisfy the needs or uh, protect the needs of uh, a society where which is divided into two class and the interest of which is diametrically opposite to each other and therefore they call bourgeois democracy as a sham as a meaningless a hollow term so the political power uh, in their understanding is the handmade of economic power which lies with the bourgeoisie or the capitalist and therefore liberal democracy really do not serve the interest of the large majoritarian working class so marxist then argue about overthrowing this capitalist class or liberal democracy and um, replacing this with the dictatorship of proletariat so according to marxism dictatorship of proletariat is different from the popular notion of dictatorship which is despised as the selfish immoral irresponsible and unconstitutional so this dictatorship of proletariat is seen something which brings about radical transformation in the social economic and the political life of the society and these are like socialization of uh, the major means of production planning of material production so as to serve social needs that provide right to work education health and housing for all and fuller development of science and technology so as to multiply material production to achieve greater social satisfaction so uh, this dictatorship of proletariat 
is supposed to bring about the social, economic and political transformation in the society. However, this is not the final stage, but only an interim stage from a capitalist bourgeoisie democracy to a stateless communist society where there will be no need of a state and the society will not be divided into two class as it is there in the capitalist uh, society. And therefore, in that society, there is a no need of a state because it will be a kind of self-governing society based on the interest of each and all and not uh, divided into two classes such as bourgeoisie or proletariat that exist in the uh, uh, capitalist society. So, revolutionary Marxists such as Lenin and Rosa Luxemburg reject the idea that there can be a democratic road to socialism. So, on the method of how to replace a um, capitalist system with the uh, dictatorship of proletariat or socialism, so some uh, theorists argue that it is possible only through a, uh, a revolution and uh, Lenin and Rosa Luxemburg argued about that kind of overthrowing the existing state with a violent revolution. An alternative tradition nevertheless recognizes the electoral democracy that gives the working class a voice and may even be vehicle for far-reaching social change. So, there are different variants of bringing about social and economic transformation, not uh, just by uh, violent revolution, but also through election or participating in the democratic process through which one can uh, achieve far-reaching social and economic transformation in the society. So, within the Marxism, you have a uh, range of um, um, arguments about how to bring about those uh, changes and create a society which will be truly just, uh, free, equal and democratic. So, these are the Marxist approach to the question of democracy. Now, moving on to the participative model of democracy, which is a kind of uh, direct uh, democracy, which we have discussed in the last class. And uh, Rousseau is exponent of this popular sovereignty or participative uh, model of democracy. And in his classic work, The Social Contract, he asserted that sovereignty not only originates in the people, it also retained by the people in spite of their transition from the state of nature to the soul society. So, the sovereignty rests with the people. Two well-known political uh, scientists, Macpherson and Patman, also developed the concept of participative democracy. It emphasized on people's direct political participation in a uh, democratic process. So, in short, political participation denotes the active involvement of individuals and groups in the governmental process affecting their lives. So, usually the modern democracy is not direct participatory uh, democracy in a sense people govern themselves through their representative indirectly. But uh, participatory democracy and the theorist of participatory democracy argue that people should directly uh, participate in the decision making and the governmental process and they are the ultimate uh, sovereign as we see in the Rousseau. So, in short, political participation denotes the active involvement of individuals and groups in the governmental process affecting their lives. In other words, in this model, citizens themselves play an active role in the process of formulation and implementation of public policies and decisions. Their activity is called political participation and according to uh, Rousseau, every law the people had not ratified in person, that means in their direct participation is null and void, cannot be implemented. So, uh, the critique of uh, this participatory model of democracy argue uh, that advocates of participatory democracy seems to be too optimistic in a sense that it is not possible first in a large uh, country with huge population to sit together at one place and then collectively decide on some uh, matter. So, it is perhaps too optimistic to think about a participatory direct model of democracy and people's participation in a democracy can reasonably be increased to a some extent, but beyond that it may be harmful also. So, ordinarily people are not endowed with the adequate passions and insight 
which may cause delay in ben uh, beneficial policies and programs. So, largely the population are uh, regulated by emotions or uh, passions and uh, do not have the patience to uh, deliberate on the issue of national importance in a calm manner, in a patient manner uh, through uh, logic and not uh, by passion or emotion. And therefore, uh, too much of uh, public participation can also be detrimental to the beneficial policies and programs of the state. So, these are some of the criticism against the participative model of democracy. Now, moving on to the next model of democracy, we have the developmental model of democracy where we find in uh, John Stuart Mill where democracy is seen as a model of government which enables the individual to develop his faculty. It is for the individual as well as for the society. So, David Held in his books Models of Democracy wrote, if Bentham and James Mill were reluctant Democrats, as I said that democracy is not something which is always desirable. It is only in the modern times which when it becomes the legitimizing idea. So, there was a kind of reluctant or suspicions or apprehensive of uh, democracy because it is also equated with the mob rule or mobocracy for a very long time. So, uh, David Hale writes that if Bentham and James Mill were reluctant Democrats, but prepared to develop arguments to justify democratic institution, John Stuart Mill was a clear advocate of democracy, preoccupied with the extent of individual liberty in all sphere of human endeavors. So, on liberty we have discussed this idea of uh, John Stuart Mill's in defense of individual liberty. So, liberal democratic government uh, was important to him because it was an important aspect of the free development of individuality. Participation in political life was vital to create a direct interest in government and responsibility, a basis for an informed and developing citizenry for a dynamic developmental policy. So, this uh, participation or um, deliberation in the decision making is vital for the social or individual development and progress. So, John Stuart Mill is a prime advocate of developmental democracy. He did not only concentrate on the power and function of democracy to protect rights and liberties, but also on its power to develop the faculties of the men. So, John Stuart Mill viewed democracy in this light and C. B. Macpherson first drew the attention of political scientists to it. So, according to Macpherson and Dunn, for John Stuart Mill, democracy was a very powerful mechanism for moral self-development and highest and harmonious expansion of human capacity because it is not a rule based on coercion of one against the other. It is uh, the collectivities coming together and deliberating in a rational manner and that uh, creates the individual which is morally or intellectually far more developed than he or she was prior to such uh, deliberation. So, for male uh, democracy is a powerful mechanism for the moral development and highest and harmonious expansion of individual capacity. We are thus in possession of two elements of development. One is moral self-development and the other is development of individual capacity. Both of these are uh, developed in a democratic setup. So, by individual capacity, meal meant the argumentative power of men intellect, reasoning to understand the distinction between right and wrong and above all the ability to participate in the process of government. So, democracy not just uh, help individual to develop his or her moral shape, but also his or her capacity to reason, to argue, to distinguish between right and uh, wrong and also to arrive at a consensus in a logical deliberation. So, Mill was also indebted to de Tocqueville, who write this text called uh, Democracy in America. It was the conviction of Tocqueville that the increasing intervention of the state was born to curve the freedom of individual and that would be harmful for progress. The government must keep itself away from the intrusive interference and Mill 
होल हार्टेडली सब्सक्राइब टू दिस आइडिया ऑफ द टॉक विल लिव एंड लाइक हिम विल कंक्लूडेड दैट इफ इट इज नॉट कॉन्टेड इट वुड बिकम ए रिसाइब फॉर कैपिचुलेशन टू डिक्टेट ऑफ द एडमिनिस्ट्रेटर सो मिल ऑल्सो आर्ग्यू डेट स्टेट एंड द गवर्नमेंट मस्ट नॉट इंटरफेयर इन द लाइफ ऑफ द पीपल पर्टिकुलरली द एरिया विच इज सेल्फ रिगार्डिंग फंक्शन ऑफ द इंडिविजुअल ओनली सम रिजनेबल रिस्ट्रिक्शन कैन बी पुट विच इज द अदर्स रिगार्डिंग दैट रिलेट्स टू पब्लिक लाइफ सो इन दिस डेवलपमेंटल मॉडल ऑफ डेमोक्रेसी ए क्लियर डिमार्केशन बिटवीन स्टेट एंड सिविल सोसाइटी इज मेनटेन ईच हैज इट्स ऑन ए स्पेसिफिक एरिया ऑफ जोरिस्ट्रिक्शन एंड अंडर नॉर्मल सर्कमस्टांसिस स्टेट must not interfere with the functions of civil society and the various or uh, voluntary organizations in the civil society so both individual and society should be allowed to function independently of the governmental control or interference now uh, next is the pluralist model of democracy and robert dahl is a leading exponent of the pluralist theory of democracy so he contrasts modern democratic systems with the classical democracy of ancient greece using the term polyarchy polyarchy refers to the rule by many as distinct from the idea of rule by all citizens so empirical study led him to conclude that the system of competitive election prevent any permanent elite from emerging and ensure wide if imperfect access to the political process so the political process is open for everyone even if that uh, openness is somewhat imperfect yet it is not limited to a permanent elite in the pluralist uh, democracy we find that the policy making process however centralized it may appear in form is in reality a highly decentralized process of bargaining among relatively autonomous groups so there are different groups competing and expressing their interest on some issue which concerns them and the final decision that is taken is the result of this uh, bargain among these autonomous groups so it is not a kind of centralized decision making which we often uh, see in the arguments of the elitist theory of democracy so in other words public policy is not a product of the will of the elite or the chosen few as the elitist theory of democracy argue on the contrary it is an outcome of interaction of all groups who make claims upon and express interest in that particular issue so to the extent to which different groups will get their way is a function of the strength of groups and the intensity of their participation so which groups gets what is dependent on their interest and the involvement in the deliberation about that uh, issue so in fact the pluralist theory calls for the revision of democratic theory itself as well as of the elitist theory of democracy in its view policy making is actually done neither by the representatives of a coherent majority nor by an autonomous and unresponsive elite but is a product of interaction among the groups so these groups are multiple or plural in the society and their interaction uh, leads to the formulation of policy and not it by the uh, representative of the coherent majority or by a autonomous unresponsive elite so the role of groups or uh, different groups in the society is Uh, uh central in the understanding of democracy in the pluralist model of democracy or what robert dal called polyarchy so the elitist if we make the comparison between elitist and the pluralist model of democracy we find that the elitist model concedes that the policy making in a democracy is the function of the elite so elite takes the decision the people role is merely limited or confined to the approval and rejection of the particular policies made or advanced by the competing elites or in the choosing of that elites beyond that it is left for the elite to take uh, take decisions so the role of a people is merely uh, or confined to just approving or rejecting a particular elite beyond that it is the uh, elite which takes the decision and the pluralist theory view policy making in a democracy as a decentralized process 
characterized by bargaining between different groups as we have discussed. So, the pluralist theories are more optimistic than the elitist theories because they repudiate the authoritarian basis of policy making in a democracy. It is not one man or few chosen men which takes decision on behalf of everyone. It is the result of constant or rigorous bargaining among the different groups in the society and that makes the democracy a vibrant system of rule. So, the elitist pluralist theory of democracy tries to justify the phenomena of domination on grounds of certain outstanding inborn qualities of persons or on grounds of better organization of certain interest of different groups and so on. In effect, both of them tends to maintain the status quo. So, unlike Marxist theory of democracy which talks about transformation of social and economic relations, uh, pluralist and elitist theory talks about maintaining the status quo. Now, we will come to uh, deliberative model of democracy which emphasize on the deliberation and dialogue as a mode of democratic decision making. So, deliberative democracy questions the limited and the narrow conception of political participation in liberal democracy. So, in liberal democracy, the political participation is basically by and large limited to uh, electing the government or uh, right to vote is such broad popular uh, participation. In deliberative democracy, that is regarded as a limited political participation, where they argue for a kind of sustained uh, participation in deliberation and dialogue of democratic decision making. So, instead it focuses on dialogue and deliberation as the legitimate mode of arriving at decision making in a democracy. So, decision making in a democracy must be result of this sustained deliberation and dialogue and the involvement of population in such dialogue and deliberation. So, here the understanding of dialogue and discussion is more than a process in a sense that it is not just enough to have deliberation and dialogue it also has the potential to transform the individual and his or her thinking. So, it has transformative impact on the person participating in a free and equal manner in democratic deliberation. So, that is something which is much beyond the idea of dialogue and deliberation merely as a process. So, when individual participate in a deliberation and discussion in a free and fair manner, it has transformative impact on his thinking or his uh, ideals. So, David Miller, Dreisek, Joshua Cohen and Iris Marion Young are theorists who develop the uh, deliberative model of democracy and Iris Marion Young identified these four normative uh, ideals that is related to this deliberative uh, democracy. First is the idea of inclusion that means the process of dialogue and deliberation is not exclusive. It includes every free every member in the society and uh, they should participate in the deliberation. It do not exclude the female or illiterate or say the marginalized or the vulnerable. The first um, uh, criteria or normative um, ideal of a deliberative democracy is it is inclusive. The second is the political equality. So, in the deliberation none of the individual or participating member is given any higher status. All are free and also equal. The second is then the deliberation must be based on the reasonableness and that is something which one develops when we participate in the dialogue and deliberation that what should be said and what should not be said. On what ground we should uh, convince the other. So, it is not just enough to express what you think or what you recognize as correct, but also you have to use the logic and reason to convince other that whatever you think is right not just for you, but for everyone. So, the deliberative uh, exercise help us to develop this reasonableness and the final is the publicity. Publicity is it creates a public where we uh, treats each other uh, or which we uh, hold each other accountable. So, in free and fair deliberation in public realm is therefore, uh, require the individual to make the statement or a speech on the basis of logic 
and that uh, speech or statement can be countered by other to hold him or her accountable for what he is see, speaking on. So, these four normative ideals makes the democratic democracy an effective tool for self-government. So, they talk about both the procedural as well as the substantive aspect of deliberation and it requires participant to be open and attentive to each other. So, the benefit of um, uh, deliberative democracy is possible when the participant is open or not closed. That means, you just speak and do not listen. Even you listen, you do not, uh, do not accept even the argument is logically uh, convincing. So, uh, deliberation requires a degree of openness and attentiveness to each other to justify their claims and proposals in terms acceptable to all. The orientation of participants move from self-regarding to orientation towards what is publicly assertable. So, this interests and preference continue to have a place in the process of deliberative democracy, but not as given or exogenous to process. Thus, the process of deliberation is central in the models of democracy, which also leads to some substantive impact on those who are participating. So, it is a uh, process of arriving at decision and in the process of arriving at decision, individual also learn uh, or develop uh, uh, the capacity to state his or her interest in a manner which is acceptable to the others and also listen to the others. So, so these have a kind of positive impact on the participant in the deliberation. Now, the finally and the last model of democracy is the consociational democracy. Although this notion of consociationalism is known since the 17th century, it was conceptualized in 1960s in particular by Arendt Lisford. So, consociationalism, uh, a stable democratic system in deeply divided society. Consociationalism is a a stable democratic system in deeply divided societies that is based on power sharing between elites and different social groups. So, consociationalism talks about a kind of collective government, especially in a society which is divided in different groups on racial, ethnic or other lines. So, this system involves a elaborate mechanism to ensure minority representation. So, even those who are in the minority should have a say in the policy making or in the decision making of the government. It is regarded particularly suitable for uh, the governance in a society which is deeply divided by religious, ideological, linguistic, regional, cultural, racial or ethnic lines. So, if a society is divided on these lines, the consociational model of democracy is regarded as the most suitable form of governance. The two central characteristics of consociationalism are government by grand coalition and segmental autonomy. So, all the groups has certain autonomy, but government function as a large grand coalition. So, uh, government by grand uh, coalition is the institutional setting in which representatives of all significant segments divided on linguistic, racial, cultural, ethnic, racial lines participate in the common decision making with regard to common concerns whereas decision making remains autonomous for all other issues. So, in all respects, consociationalism contrasts profoundly with the majoritarian uh, role in the democracy, which is about those who have the majority uh, get the final say in the decision making. In the consociational model, even the fragmented uh, minority have their say in the decision making of the government. So, uh, consociational democracy has been tried or experimented in many parts of the world. For instance, in Austria, uh, Catholic or Socialist parties formed a coalition from 1945 to 1966. In Netherlands, this principle was adopted from 1970 to 1967. And in Lebanon, consociational democracy remains operative from 1943 to 1957. In fact, consociational uh, democracy provides for a working uh, government in a society sharply divided uh, by multifarious interest or divided on so many social, ethnic, cultural, racial and linguistic lines. So, consociational democracy as a model of government helps in the 
making of decision making in the government by uh, providing the space even to the fragmented minorities in the society. So, it takes everyone along in the uh, uh, decision making or in the governing process, particularly in a society which is deeply divided on uh, religious, ideological, linguistic, uh, cultural, racial and ethnic lines. So, uh, these are some of the models of democracy which we have discussed and on this you can refer to some of these books like Jan Kisrinivasan and then John Drezek, Norman Berry and David Held. So, these are some of the texts which you can refer to and uh, that is all for today's lecture. In the next class, we will look at some of the critical aspect of uh, democracy. So, thanks for listening. Thank you all.